What is up, Fight fans? Back with a proper UFC chat with a slightly different look this week. Uh, your boy Mason right here, joined with us by our friend Joe. Uh, Dave wasn't able to make it this week, had some stuff pop up. We kept trying to push the taping back, but just couldn't happen. So Joe, nice enough to hop in and join with us. Joe, you want to introduce yourself a little bit, give people your Twitter handle and all that kind of good stuff? Yeah, absolutely. I, thanks, thanks, Mason, for having me on. And thanks, Dave, also for reaching out. I know he's been traveling all week, so it's been tough for him to make the show. He will be back next week, I'm told, so that's good news. Uh, the show will be as normal. Uh, my name's Joe, also known on Twitter as Fire Up MMA Capper. Um, so you can feel free to follow me there. Uh, on a hot streak right now, I've won eight straight events in UFC, so looking to build upon it and hopefully get to nine straight winning cards. And, yeah, looking forward to talking some fights with you today, Mason. Oh, yeah, man. Eight's, uh, eight in a row is tough to do for sure. I definitely can't say I'm on the same streak. I had a really, really small, basically break-even loss last card, but it's impressive. So hopefully we can keep it going. With uh, our first fight here, we got 14 of them for y'all. We'll try to push through it a little bit, not give you all three hours worth of content. Because uh, first up should be a pretty short one with Jocelyn Edwards taking on Lucy Pudilova. Uh, this isn't a fight I'm super interested in. Pudilova's kind of making her return back. Jocelyn Edwards has looked pedestrian kind of in her best attempts. Uh, I will say Edwards' takedown defense has looked better her last few fights, which was really a thorn in her side early. So gun to my head, I would maybe lean Edwards' side, but nothing I'm super excited in. Uh, Joe, anything you're sort of feeling? You know, I'm kind of a little different, but same boat. I'm not super interested in this fight. Um, I do agree, though, Edwards' takedown defense did look much improved in her last uh few fights but still have some worries about our takedown defense so i do think pudelova has more ways to win the fight if she were to do that um in saying that i think on the feet it's gonna be close i do lean edwards on the feet but i do think pudelova she lands some takedowns can win some minutes and win some rounds like you said i'm not in love with this fight i think it's a lower level female fight i think it's gonna go to the scorecards and whatever side you're on you're gonna be sweating the decisions so i think it is a closer fight um if i gun to my head who do you think wins? I would say Pudilova, but I'm not running to the <laughs> the bookie <laughs> to bet bet this one. So I'm kind of in the same boat as you are, but opposite gun to my head pick, I guess. Yeah, no, I mean, especially when uh, looking over at the odds, if you're getting a, about a minus 130 I'm seeing right now over on Pudilova, about plus 115-ish on Edwards. Bookies kind of agree. They don't really have much to say on this one either. So, yeah, kudos to you if anyone's going to take a shot, but definitely not one I'm that excited in. This next one, Aaron Phillips versus uh, Gaston Bolognese. Maybe he's a little more intriguing. Uh, also something I'm not in love to bet, but just simply due to the fact that we haven't seen Phillips in three years and we've seen Gaston once in like three and a half years just makes this kind of inherently interesting uh gaston definitely that huge muay thai base uh very one of america's most credentialed muay thai fighters um hasn't quite seen the success while transitioning into pro mma you can see he struggles in the grappling department um which kind of be expected as someone who's been a kickboxer striker muay thai artist their whole life Phillips, i sure he wrestled a little bit back when he was in high school and has uh, like some grappling experience, but he's not a ground game player per se. He kind of looks to strike in some of his own fights. Um, I'm going to expect this to be maybe a little sloppy, a little greasy. Perhaps we get a highlight spinning back elbow. Gaston loves to throw those. I think he has two or three already on his scorecards. Um, for sake of making a pick, maybe Phillips just getting that like plus 165, 170 dog money on someone with a bit more experience and a bit more well-rounded. But the flashy moment winner and better strikers for sure, Gaston. So 
be tough to fault someone looking at the other side. Yeah, I kind of see this the same way. Um, I haven't gotten as deep in research on this one. This is one of the fights I'm still researching. Um, in saying that, I feel like this fight is sort of interesting because, like you said, Gaston, he's mainly a stand-up striker, Muay Thai background, but Phillips does tend to prefer fights to stay standing. But I think if it stays standing, I do lean uh, Gaston. I don't even pronounce his last name, Bolanos. <laughs> I, I could be doing both of them wrong. I'm not a pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> At least Dave, I always watch the show every week. I know Dave butchers last names too, so he can't get on me for this one. But um, so in saying that, I wrote down lean the under two and a half at minus 145. So if I had to bet this point, that's my lean. I still need to finish research to see if the under is a good look. But I do think if it stays standing, uh, like you said, spinning back up or something crazy, maybe Gaston gets him out of there. Yeah, no, he's definitely going to be the crisper striker. Uh, Phillips likes to keep it in range, but I think every second he's at range in this fight, he's going to be in danger. Uh, so, yeah, we'll see if he goes into his full bag of tricks, but nothing I'm going to be super invested in. If anything, maybe tiny action. That under is not a bad look, though. Gaston's got some finishing equity, and he really is kind of lost on the ground. So that gives yep. you a couple outs. So I like that. Uh, moving right along, we got Bruna Brazil versus Denise Gomez for a woman's strawweight bout. Uh, been interesting this early this week, been seeing a lot of action on the Denise Gomez side. Uh, not super familiar with either of these two fighters. Um, I think Bruna Brazil maybe just going to be a little bit of the stronger side due to her size advantage she's a pretty big gal uh this is one i'll be honest probably taped the least on uh but that's also because there's not a whole lot of tape to watch on these two fighters <laughs> cumulatively so it's really tough to give them their due diligence and a strong tape study uh this is one i'm for sure going to be staying away from uh, i'm not sure if you have anything you're not jumping off the tickets for you for this one no, I'm this, this same boat. So this is another one I haven't really gotten to film on. This, so don't worry, guys. These are the only two fights I really haven't gotten to film on. Um, in saying that, um, Brazil opened up this week. Earlier this week when I wrote check lines every Monday, I usually go and check lines, write stuff down that I think stands out to me, and then research in priority order. Um, Brazil was like a minus 180, minus 185 favorite, and now she's down to, I believe, like minus 150, 155. Yep. Let me check. I'm saying. Yeah, so that does open up a little bit more possibilities. I was leaning Brazil, but at minus 180, I couldn't touch it. In saying that, I highly doubt I bet this for a few reasons. Uh, Gomez is only 23 years old, so she's rapidly improving. And we've seen a lot of times on the Contender Series when these young Brazilian females come in, they look completely different than how they did on all their film leading up to the Contender Series fight. I don't know what they drink down there in Brazil, but but it, they show up even better in the UFC, it seems like, every time. So I think she is making rapid improvements. So I'd say 99% chance I passed in this fight. I still have film to go though. So you never know if something boggles my mind, but I I'm with you. I think this is a pass. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Uh, there's a strong chance. She might be a newer, improved version of herself. 23. You almost have to expect literally every time you see him to have like noticeable marketed Jumps. improvements. So definitely something I wasn't thinking of, but uh, yeah, that's a good kind of, Get your dinner cooking, go walk the dogs. It's not a fight I'm going to be like really upset on if I'm in the Uber on the way to the bar for that one. Yeah. Don't invite your friends over and for that one. Have them come over right after that fight. Uh, this next fight, I will be upset because I do like watching Lando Venata fights. We got Groovy Lando Venata versus Danielle Zellhuber. Um, Lando's one of those win one, lose one over like the full course yeah. of career fighters, which I always find really interesting just in and of itself. I almost wonder if how much like sports psychology plays into people who have extended back and forth trades. Uh, Zell Huber, 12 and one, but that one loss, damn, was it bad. And I think everyone collectively in the MMA community is pretty pissed at him for it uh close what was that like minus 400 in that fight trey ogden and just laid the fattest of eggs possible looked like william knight totally froze deer in headlights it was 
it's a really, really bad look. Uh, I will say I think that's probably the worst we will ever see Daniel Zellhuber in his career. Uh, it's kind of nice when you know what the nut low of a fighter is going to be. And I don't know. I don't want to completely throw him under the bus because everything leading up to that sure was exciting and felt promising. And then that fight just it all completely fell off, off the rails. Maybe he gets it back on here. I think uh, a lot of people are short selling them right now and aren't very high on them. And I get it. It'll take probably one or two really good performances before people will ever want to trust him again. But we're not laying minus 300 in this fight. It's like a minus 130 right now. Uh, and yeah, Lando's either going to show up or he's really not going to show up. And even. Even if Trey Ogden's version, if Zell Huber shows up against a bad Lando, I'm not so sure he's just going to get absolutely wiped. So maybe leaning Zell Huber. I just don't really have the courage to uh, go back to the well after that last that last scarring. What about you? I'm kind of in the same boat. So I actually parlayed Zell Huber, and he laid a fat egg, like you said, for me. And after that, I told myself I'd never bet this guy again. So he looked like a deer in headlights, like you said. And it's one of those typical – First fight in the UFC, deer in headlights, the stage is too big for me type of moments, it felt like. And saying that, on his contender series fight, he looked good. He filmed before that he looked good. So I'm not sure what to make of it. If he comes like that, I think Lando makes it easy. I think it, like, it's one of those fights, like, how was this guy minus 300 against this young up-and-coming fighter? But I do think if Zell Huber shows up like he did on the contender series fight, he does beat Venata. So that kind of leaves me in a stage where I don't feel comfortable on either side. Gun to my head, I would probably take Fanata just because I think it's possible he shows up looking like a shell of himself again. And this time there's a crowd too. I believe there wasn't a crowd. I have to double check. I don't remember if there's a crowd not for Trey Ogden fight. I don't but remember if that was a, like an apex fight yeah, or not. I can't not. remember. I think it was an apex fight, but still small crowd, but this should be a bigger crowd. Um, yeah. I, like you said, it's weird. Lando exchange, win, loss, win, loss. So this time technically it should be a winner or a draw. That's one way of looking at it too. But I don't know. He's Lando Venata is super exciting to watch. I would highly recommend tuning in uh, to this fight regardless because Al Huber did show a lot of promise before. Uh, for me, it's dog or pass just because he yeah, let the odds do the work. I think it's a 50 50 fight, and, but at plus 105 right now for Venata, I'm not betting it. So right now, this is a pass, but if odds were to move either way and one of them gets like plus 120, I'd probably consider it just because I do think it's a closer fight and depends what version of Zell Huber and Venata show up because they're both kind of inconsistent to me anyway. Yeah, no, it's uh, from what we've seen, especially recently, I'd say inconsistent is about the best way to explain Sel Huber. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this one isn't one I'm super excited to bet, but definitely one I'm excited to watch. And uh, I know here coming up on this next one, we have some action with Jillian Roberts and Pereira Rodriguez. Uh, I'm not sure I've ever been a bigger betting fan of an 11 and seven fighter than Jillian Robertson, but ah oh man, I'm all the way in. Uh, not all red hair fighters are the same. Like this isn't random. <laughs> <laughs> We've got to see her grow up. She's, I want to say 27 now has been in the UFC for six years. So there have been some times we've seen Jillian go out and it's kind of been like, what was that? But she was pretty young. She's been growing up, a lot of good experience against some of the best women in this division, which not an ultra rich, deep division, but I would rather her be getting that experience at 22 in the UFC than in the RFA or something, you know? So I really enjoy, enjoy that. Prayer Rodriguez, her regional scene, like that's what I'm talking about. How much stock can you put into these nine and oh wins? Like, some of these women are moms, cab drivers, just like it doesn't make any sense. I'm a little nervous with Jillian moving down to 115 uh, with her weight cut. I want to see how that goes on the scales. She'd done it before in her career, so she has made it, and she's coming down to it off a of win, which all things that don't freak me out because fighters dropping weight classes be a little iffy, but. The circumstances surrounding these doesn't really give me like caution. 
Uh, I will be seeing tomorrow how she looks on the scales. She looks like Skeletor. I might freak out a little bit, but uh, this is one Dave and I have even been talking about. I know he can't really share his thoughts, but he is big on Jillian this week himself also. And yeah, I just really think the submission game is going to be too much. Prayer is probably going to get tapped out. And yeah, I'm riding Jillian all the way. and I'll be picking up that sub prop too, unless I see death on the scales. Yeah, we are on the exact same side here. So, I like you mentioned, I am a little worried about Jillian's weight cut. However, if she does look good, I, I'm with you. I think she's a pretty much half to better. One thing that I do think is working for her here, though, is her biggest flaw has always been not being able to get women to the ground or staying on top of them with that physicality game and women's MMA that could always play such a big part in those fights for females. And I think at 115, that problem kind of, I wouldn't say fully goes away, but it at least isn't as big of an issue. She should be a little bit bigger than per, uh, Rodriguez here. Um, and like you mentioned, I'm not sure how strong that, um, where's she from, Ecuador, Venezuela, how strong that Venezuelan MMA scene is for before she got to the contender series. I do think that whenever Kay Hansen, I know Kay's out of UFC now, doesn't look great, but at the time I thought she was a decent prospect. Mm -hmm. She beat Sam Hughes, who just came off a big one last week. So I don't think she's a bum or anything, but I do think that if, Jillian can get the fight to the ground. I think she, she can win this fight. And with most of her fights, I'd always do like under two and a half, or like you said, by sub, because how she normally wins is by submission. So I think those are two great sides, and I'm on the same side you are. But like you mentioned, I do want to wait to see how she looks at weight cut or at weigh-ins, see how the weight, the weight cut went. Um, but yeah, she's one of the names I wrote down that I'm probably going to be betting. You'll probably see on my card when I drop it Friday night. Yeah. I'm getting a little nervous about waiting for the weigh-ins just because one, I don't really anticipate it being terrible. A uh, 27 year old girl in great shape, just planning on this move, not short notice or anything. Like I'm confident that it's going to go well. Uh, but man, that line's been moving on her. I wanted to bet her at like plus 110 really wanted to better at like minus 110 and now she's minus 125 and I don't know why I'm waiting to pull the trigger uh I just kind of need to probably get on it before because I don't really want love her at like minus 160 or something like that so I'm on the same boat and uh yeah because I wrote it down originally at minus 115 when I got the research done I wanted to wait for the weight cup and now she's up to like minus 130 in one book uh minus 120 still in the other so I might after this show here and that you and Dave both like it, just fire away at least for like one unit and add in our unit. She looks good at a different line and give you guys the, um, whatever lines available on Friday and track it as the, whatever lines available Friday to keep things fair. But if you look at her losses too, she's lost a beast in the division, Talia Santos, Miranda Maverick, even JJ Aldridge is a pretty good fighter in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So this is a, I would, a step down for an undefeated fighter is hard to say, but Oh, I think there's levels to the competition a little bit too, you could say. Yeah, it's a lateral step at worst. If it's not a step down, it's for sure only sideways. Yeah, 100%. Uh, so speaking of step down, next fight, we got Zach Cummings and Ed Herman in a fight that shouldn't even ever be happening. Uh, Zach Cummings, light heavyweight debut after several years of injury and time off and no training and ed herman uh jesus ed herman's 43 i want to say so you have the old the injured and the fat all in one fight <laughs> this is going to be this is going to be something uh i am not betting this fight i think cummins probably wins uh i think his leg kicks will be a good way to get up on ed and really kind of take the fight out of him early. I think Zach's powers, despite being the smaller guy coming up, like I think he can probably crack a little cleaner and harder. Um, there's no way in hell I'm going to lay juice on Zach Cummings at this level. And even on the total side, yeah, they're old and injured, so an under sounds great, but both these guys are durable and don't really throw much. And could see them having a staring contest for 15 minutes or one guy just dying 90 seconds into it so i'm gonna stay far far away how about you 
Yeah, this is a 1-800-GAMBLERS phone hotline bet. Um, I would not touch this fight anyway. I don't like an under, don't like an over, don't like a side. Like you said, gun to my head, I would take Zach Cummings. But then this week, you also mentioned retirement. This could be his retirement fight, or you said it's highly likely it's his retirement fight. When fighters mention retirement, they usually lose. Like, look at Masvidal last week. He mentioned it on Monday, and he retired, sure enough, on Saturday after the loss. Um, yeah, I will say, going back, these guys have both cost me some money, though. I, every time I pretty much automatically fade these guys, and they cost me somehow. And I don't think either of them are great. Like, I bet Trevin Giles against Zach Cummings, and Zach Cummings beat him back in 2019. And that one sticks out to me. But, Yeah. I don't want any part of this. I'm with you. They could stare at each other, like you said, for 15 minutes, or both these guys are old, could go down, but they're both tough as nails. Both don't really have much finishing power. I don't know. This is a weird one. Yeah, no, this, I don't really understand why this is happening, because it's not like there was 11 fights on this card, or 10, and they're like, oh, we need one more. We got 14, like, <laughs> I don't know why this is happening. But I'm not complaining about action, so. Yeah, gun to my head, it'd be dog or pass for me, probably. Probably Herman at the current line. At like, what is he now? I can't find it. Like, plus 180. If I had to, like, let's say, fire up on me, Capper, you have to bet this fight. What would you pick? I'd probably be at Herman, but I'm not betting this fight. Ah, uh, Right. Moving on to our next fight in UFC Kansas City, we got Brandon Roy Val, Mateus Nicolau. Uh, this fight should be entertaining, to at least. Um, Brandon Roy Val is kind of a crazy guy. He's a lot of just hell on wheels for like seven, eight minutes, and then kind of slows down and sort of falls off. Nicolau. Not the most volume, but if he cracks, man, is he pretty strong for this weight division. Um, both of them, I feel like, have some really good finish equity. I think Roy Val, especially early, is pretty squirrely on the ground. Um, might be able to get some wrestling success going, and uh, I think would definitely be the better jiu-jitsu player out of the two. But I think Nikolaou's got more knockout power, uh, especially as Roy Val tires. So I'm looking at under uh, two and a half rounds at like minus 120, 125 right around now. Kind of like the Nick Lau side if I was leaning aside, but I don't want to really play that much juice on him or maybe like a knockout prop to get that lower. But under two and a half without having to pick a side and just hoping for violence, I think is going to be how I end up betting this fight. Um, very excited for this one. I think it's to be could over be over in an instant with a variety of different finishes. So it's always fun. Yeah, I, I agree with pretty much everything you said. I, I don't think Brandon Royval's ever been in a boring fight. So uh, it's giant chaos every time he steps in the octagon. Um, this is probably one of the fights I'm looking forward to most, or at least top three on this card. I love Brandon Royval fights, Raw Dog, Brandon Royval. Um, and Nikolai was a very talented fighter in his own right. Um, I agree with your entire breakdown. I do think that, hypothetically speaking, if this does go to the scorecards, I couldn't see Roy Val out um, like with more volume than Nicolau and picking up a decision. So I do like Roy Val here, but I also do like your under because I think Roy Val just causes chaos. And I think it is likely he could get caught and finished, or if somehow they get into a scramble, I think Roy Val can get a sub and either choke out or catch Nicolau, like you said, in, in the jujitsu game. Um, so I. More with you on the under, um, but I also do like Roy Ball here. Yeah, no, uh, I mean he's a good fighter. There's, <laughs> there's no question about it. I'm, uh, I'm excited to see Nicolau's kind of almost getting a, I don't know, not a step up, but finally getting some more consistent level of fights. Uh, not he's not fighting Tim Elliott anymore. Like we're getting some Dvorak's, we're getting Matt, Matt Schnell, Brandon Roy Val. It's like, all right, we're actually going to see if this guy's going to like crack the top ten and go deep. So, yeah, hundred percent. I do think Roy Val's a step up for Nicolau too, like you mentioned. Um, but Roy Val is very likely, like you said, to get get caught. He's gotten dropped. I feel like almost every fight, but it leads to a like he doesn't get put out. He just like scrambles and creates more chaos, or he drops him right back, like the 
if you guys haven't watched it, I'd highly recommend going back and watch that Kai Kara France fight with Brandon Royval. That was a banger. So I'm excited for this fight. And yeah. Yeah. No. And uh, I know you were saying you're kind of leaning the Roy Val side. He has fought the better level of competition, I would say for sure. So getting some dog money in him. So honestly, probably not a bad look. I just worry his cardio might slow down and Nick Lau can boink him. But yeah. I don't think you have a bad bet either way you want to look at either side here. Moving on, we got Bill Algio versus TJ Brown. Uh, this is another one that I'm kind of missing out on the line movement a little bit. Loved Bill Algio at minus 150, um, minus 190, minus 200. It's a little scary. I'm even seeing him crack like 215 in some spots. I kind of get it. TJ Brown uh notoriously low fight iq is how i would put it he looked a lot better his last time out uh he had a more thought out game plan and he stuck to it he still couldn't quite figure out how to not have a shitty haircut but like steps in the right direction and the best skill in tj's tool belt is his wrestling and I'd say Bill's biggest weakness is for sure is takedown defense. Uh, everyone takes Algio down, and normally more than once. Uh, if you shoot 10 on him, probably going to see four, five, six hitting the mat. But Bill has a great get-up game. I don't really ever see him get held down. You can take him down, tie yourself out, have these big explosive movements. He's just going to pop up and start throwing some volume back at you. Uh, pretty good jujitsu game. So off of his back, he can have some submission threats, which helps him stand up. And I also think uh, his reversals and sweeps are really well. So if you do get those four or five out of the 10, he might flip you over on one or two of them also. So I'm not too terribly worried about TJ's wrestling for Algio, uh, especially as the fight gets further and further. Um, if TJ just takes him down and grounds him and holds him there, I'll get really, really nervous and probably try to live bet him. But I'm going to have Bill Algio in some parlays this week for sure. Would have bet him straight, but I'm, I'm slow, so I missed it. I have the exact same read you do here. I, I looked on Monday, and Algio was minus 175, and I couldn't believe my eyes. And then I checked literally the next day, and I think he was already up to like minus 200. I think the line has came down a little bit. Or no, he's still minus 200. Well, yeah, he's definitely a parlay piece for me. Um, Ojo, he's a tall fighter. He looks huge at his division. Almost every fight he's towering over his opponent. Like you said, with tall fighters, generally they have bad takedown defense, and Ojo is no different. Um, in saying that, like you already mentioned, he does have a good get-up game. Um, so if a fighter has bad takedown defense, but they always scramble, fight, and work their way up using the cage or you know creating scrambles, I usually don't rate that against them as heavily as you, instead of if you get laid on for a full round. Um, so I am leaning Aljo here. Like you mentioned, TJ Brown notoriously has a generally a bad fight IQ, bad game plans going to fights, but he did look a lot better against Eric Silva. So if he does wrestle and beats me and be, beats Bill Aljo, I'll just take it on the chin. But I do believe I'm going to have Bill Aljo in some parlays um, with a fighter I, we may be talking about here probably shortly. Nice. Yeah, I, uh, I tried to fade TJ Brown with Silva. It didn't quite work. Uh, I'm willing to go back to battle again. I think Algio is a bit just better, more well-rounded, and uh, better cardio for sure than Eric Silva. So I just, I don't know. I don't think he'll accept the position as much. And if TJ just happens to be magically stronger and really is holding him down, uh, Silva is not as good off of his back with submissions as Algio. So still get a Hail Mary triangle or something. Yeah, Algio's got cardio for days, too. So even if he does lose round one, gets held down a little bit, I'm not going to be sweating too much until it looks that way. Probably, like you said, midway through round two, if that's still an issue, then you might need a finish. But I think Aljo should better stand up, create scrambles. As long as he doesn't get held down, I think we should be okay here. All right, moving on over to the main card now. We got – we don't. We have Clay Guida versus Rafa Garcia. Uh, old versus young. I freaking love Clay Guida. I don't know a single person who doesn't love Clay Guida. Um, 
how can you not love watching his brother smack the shit out of him right before he walks in the octagon? My one hope for this fight is it goes past the first round so we get a nice big Clay Guida burp before the round starts again. Like, just all some vintage good stuff. Uh, that being said, he's got a lot in front of him on his plate with Rafa Garcia. Um, Rafa's kind of, I mean, if not looking in the mirror like a younger Clay Guida, but there's a lot of similarities you could draw between. He's very in your face with pressure. He's looking to strike, to get you on your back foot, shoot takedowns beyond the cage. Um, they fight kind of a similar style. Um, one's just 14 years younger than the other one. I do think Rafa maybe strike for strike might be a little bit better on the feet. Uh, he is no technician by any stretch of the imagination, but I don't know. Clay's kind of getting up there. I don't really want to get against him, especially with the biggest favorite on the card in Rafa Garcia, who, while he does get more than three takedowns in all of his fights, he gives up takedowns for some people who aren't that great. Uh, if Natan Levy is taking you down, Clay Guida is going to take you down. I don't care if you took Levy down seven times, he got you three. So if Guida is actually the better wrestler here, that would be very nerve wracking. And it was three years ago, but that Chris Gutzmacher fight, Rafa gassed hard after that first like six minutes. Didn't look good. And if you're if you don't have 15 minutes of cardio against Clay Guida, your ass is in trouble. So I don't know. I'm, those are kind of the things holding me off lining up on Rafa, but I definitely still think he's the side. Yeah, I was gonna parlay Rafa Garcia. And with Bill Aljo is probably my game plan. I haven't bet it yet, but that he's only their favorite on the card that I really lean heavily. I do think Rafa Garcia gets this done. Like you mentioned, my big concern is he did get taken down a few times by Levy. And Clay Guida has shown to be able to adjust his game plans pretty well. I don't know if you remember the Michael Johnson fight. He was down around, lost the first round pretty bad. Second round was losing the beginning, landed a takedown. And the third round, he pretty much just held him with a body lock the whole time, like a body triangle. Just held his back. Couldn't, wasn't doing much, just landing consistent little ground to pound shots, but just pretty much held position and beat Michael Johnson. Um, so that fight really stuck out to me where it does give me some concern about Rafa Garcia because I do think he gets taken down. Guida can probably hold him down there. But as far as stand up, I do think Rafa Garcia has more volume, can crack harder. Like he's not the most precise boxer in the world in the UFC, but I do think his boxing is pretty decent. Um, so I do lean Rafa Garcia here, but there is still some concern. And it wouldn't shock me if Rafa Garcia caught Clay Guida. Uh, it's just at 42, man. You're, especially at 155, being 42 years old, that's insane. <laughs> like yeah. Heavyweights can maybe do that, but at 155 pounds, that's tough. So eventually Guida's chin's going to go. He's been notorious having a great chin, great gas tank. He's a legend of the sport. Like you said, no one dislikes Clay Guida, so I hate fading him, but I think I am going to be on Rafa Garcia probably on – I'm going to drop my card on Friday. I need to consult with a friend of the show, Lou Betcha, figure out if this is a good split decision prop play because Clay Guida, greasy fights. Judges love them some Clay Guida. Might be <laughs> I could see it. All right. Next on the main card, we have Pedro Munoz versus Chris Gutierrez. I'm dropping my notes. Uh, yeah, this fight, I'm going to have to watch it with a couple ice packs, go buy some frozen peas because your legs are going to hurt after this. These two dudes, probably some of the most violent leg kickers in the UFC. Uh, it's going to be nasty. I've had a knee surgery before. It's going to be tough to watch this fight. Um, Pedro, little bit older than the two here. Chris is no young gun by any stretch of the imagination, but Pedro's 36, 37 now. Um, you can see him starting to show his age a little bit more. Yeah, the O'Malley fight, the eye poke stoppage, but the tides had kind of turned. The writing was on the wall. It felt like for that fight, you saw where it was going. I'm a little worried something similar could happen here. 
Uh, Chris, pretty good striker, is definitely damaging striker. Uh, if you're going to be wearing and tearing it not very well, Chris isn't someone you want to be up against. But this is a big step up for Chris also. Pedro is going to be, by and large, probably his toughest competition so far in his career. So there's a lot to say there. Um, I don't know. Gutierrez side's a little too juicy for me at the current prices, but Pedro's a little bit too beat up for me to also think he's that live of a dog. Um, I think you might have a little bit stronger of a take on this fight than I do, so I'll let you sort of take over from here. Yeah, I agree with pretty much everything you said, and this fight reminds me of a fight that happened last week, and I'm wearing my favorite fighter shirt, Adrian Giannis. Uh, last week, he lost to Rob Font in a similar fight, as in the two fighters fight kind of similarly, and you want to think that the younger fighter is going to come in and take that spot from Pedro Munoz, but I think not so fast. Um, Pedro Munoz, I was actually at UFC 276 in July in Vegas. So it was awesome, but... Like you said, the tides were turning, but Munoz did win, in my opinion, round one. I never looked back on the judges' scorecards. We looked good, and then round two, the tides started to shift, and then the eye poke happened, and he was done. Um, but this is a big step down in competition from what he's been facing, from O'Malley, Cruz, Aldo, even Jimmy Rivera. Edgar of 2020 is a lot different than Frankie Edgar of 2022. Let's call a spade a spade. Oh, um, Aljo and Garbrandt. So even his last like, six or seven fights, Munoz is fighting killers. Um, and Gutierrez, yes, he gets big credit for that Frank Yeager knockout, but he's coming off another brutal knockout by San Hagen, and he, he's like 40. Um, like you said, I over under 300 leg kicks for this fight combined. <laughs> I don't know, but um, I do think at this point, this fight should be closer to even money. If This is a weird one. So I think gun in my head, I would take Chris Gutierrez to win. But off the value alone, I think Munoz at plus 180, I, it's pretty much a must bet. Like the ads are forced me to bet him. Um, so I'm not going to go too big on him, but I will be betting Pedro Munoz um, this weekend. Like if it was even money, I'd probably bet Gu Gutierrez, but I think this fight should be closer to like Gutierrez minus 130, Munoz plus 110, something like that. Not like plus 180, I pretty much have to bet him. I think it's close to like a 45, 55 fight instead of a, whatever the odds are now, like 60%, 70% Gutierrez, 30% Munoz, that makes sense. I don't have my implied calculator in front of me. My implied odds break down. I know but. what you mean. And, I, yeah, it's tough to disagree. I mean, taking a step up in competition and laying more than two to one long term is a really great way to not be looking in the green and be in the red for the year. Uh, bit me a lot last year. It's something I've done a little bit better on this year of uh, – avoiding that juice debut or someone making a big step up now being the favorite. And this has got that red flag written all over it. Um, the kind my question is just how durable is Munoz still, but uh, I mean, I don't know. Beaten Claris by split decision like a year and a half ago, beating Andre Ewell before that. Like you said, the Edgar fight, that's a nice win, but that's not Frankie Edgar. Uh, so this is, this is by and large a way tougher test. So I don't know. I actually, I don't hate that dog shot there at all. And uh, I know Munoz is getting old, but I don't think he's like, he's, I don't think he's ever been finished. I, I have to go back and I'm trying to scroll through topology real quick. I don't think he's ever actually been finished. Um, I do think O'Malley may have gotten it done if that fight would have gone another seven minutes like it was supposed to. O'Malley was starting to put together combos and was starting to land in the eye poke. But and O'Malley's a like a different level of striker even. I don't think him and Chris Gutierrez are close. Um, so Chris Gutierrez could, I think, win a decision with more volume and just being the more active fighter. But I do think the big step up in competition, I think Munoz's um, line should be a lot, a lot closer. Um, so he's going to be a bet for me. Yeah, no, I uh, might have to go back and do another second lap on this tape study and see how live of a dog he is because that's a pretty compelling point. Uh, coming up next, we got Dustin Jacoby, and I will do my best. Azamak Mur Murakanov, Murakanov, something like that. You also uh, 
the Kudalaba fight too. Oh, did I blow right past that? Yep. Sure did. So I will <laughs> no worries. Get a couple more minutes to practice it. Uh, That's why we need Dave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dave, you leave and just all falls off the tracks. <laughs> This is, yeah, I'm glad we didn't miss this because this is a fun fight too. Tanner Bozer, Eon Kudalaba. Uh, Eon is like the definition of a shit eating wild man. Like, uh, that dude is crazy. I honestly think some of his face offs uh, are going to keep him around in the UFC longer just for pure entertainment value. Tanner Bozer's first time stepping down to 205. Should be interesting there. Uh, he was never the biggest heavyweight. And looking on Instagram, he's looking shredded right now. Like He looks in great shape. Uh, but he was never a good wrestler up at that big boy division. He did taken down and held down. Really didn't have much off his back. Didn't have much of a get-up game. And Kudalaba, especially first-round Kudalaba, can wrestle his ass off. So that makes me very nervous for Bozer here. Um, but I'm curious just how strong Bozer will be. Uh, being taken and held down by people who are cutting the 265 is going to be a lot different than the strength coming from Kudalaba, who also about five minutes of gas. Or it might not even be gas, just five minutes of focus maybe because – as soon as that second round hits, Kudalaba's off the rails. Um, been in a lot of bad finishes lately. Shout out Johnny Walker. That submission was one of my best hits last year. That was a huge line, but I don't know. I think Bozer, if he extends this fight, should really look good. Um, I think he would have the better cardio as long as he's not on his back holding Kudalaba's weight for like 10 minutes. And but I might have the hedge of Bozer at plus money and then take Kudalaba round one also at plus money because I feel like that's almost his whole win condition. What are you seeing for this one? No, I agree with you 100%. So I think it's also like looking back. So we'll start on Ian Kudalaba. I agree 100% with what you're saying. I do think he's starting to integrate his wrestling a little more in his game plans, as you can see in some of his more recent fights, and it has helped. But instantly wrestles, I feel like he almost gasses faster. Like he's never had a good gas tank, but he's still sure if he lands a takedown of Bowser, wins round one, all of a sudden he's done. Like, why does it matter you won round one if you're gonna lose round two and three or get stopped? Um But I do think Kutalaba is a lot better fighter overall than Bozer, so it's tough. It's like I lean Kutalaba to win this fight. I think he's a lot more talented than Bozer pretty much everywhere, but I don't trust his gas tank. It is crazy to think that he was like I think minus 190 against Johnny Walker and minus 240 against Ryan Spann. Like, looking back on that, Kutalaba, like, those should have been two easy underdog winners, I think. Um, now, being a slight favorite against Bozer is kind of strange. Um, in saying that, I do lean Kutalaba, but a few props I do want to see lines for that I haven't looked at yet are Bozer decisions only. So that way, if he does get finished, it's a void bet. I think that's a good spot to look because I think Kutalaba may gasp against the scorecards or he's going to finish Bozer um, round one or round two. Another prop I like, like you mentioned, is Kutalaba round one because he does come out of the gate like a like a bat in hell and just <laughs> throws all, everything forward and can land a shot and finish him. Um, yeah, this is a strange fight. I'm excited to see this one. If Kutalaba does somehow get a gas tank, I think he... Makes it easy, but I can't trust him. Yeah, no, because if Kudalaba could wrestle for more than what I would expect, it's only going to be about five or six minutes. Shit, he could be like a minus 400 here. Uh, yeah. His Bozer's get up game is really, really bad. There is that little asterisk of at 205, is he going to be a bigger, stronger guy where that takedown defense isn't as bad? He can get just almost muscles way out of positions off the mat, uh, which we'll see. I think this will be a good answer to that because Kudalaba's a strong enough guy who's not great at holding you down, but good at going for a takedown early. So in the end, worst case scenario, we at least learn a lot more uh, about what 205 Bozer looks like. But if Bozer loses his fight, I'm not sure what's next for him. Kudalaba loses his fight. He might be getting cut. So. We'll yeah, see. Three, UFC is usually three losses and you're cut, and he's already on three. So losing to Bozer would be tough. 
Yeah, he's getting, I think, the freebie because, like I said, he's uh, he's a pretty entertaining guy. Like, I know I make – I'm going to tune in for a Neon Kudalaba fight. I'm not going to tell someone it's high-level fighting, but I'm sure it's shit going to watch. 100%. All right. And now, for real this time, we got Dustin Jacoby versus Azamat uh, Mirzakhanov. Oh, I think I did a lot better that time, too. Nailed it. That's why um Jacoby I'll admit I'm pretty biased on Jacoby I'm a big fan of his I uh I watched him play college football when he was in Culver Stockton because I was not far from where I grew up so kind of was a little bit of a fan of him early um one of my biggest I had like three 10 unit bets in my life one of them was Jacoby against Dao Yung Jung which uh Felt like I was on a bit of an island there, but I love that spot. I'm still pissed about that round tree decision. I think Jacoby won that all day. Um, but that round tree fight may look a little bit like this fight. Azamat's probably going to be a flashier striker, uh, maybe hit some bigger power shots in the moment, but he's going to get way out volume. Jacoby throws more than like 16 strikes a distance a minute versus Azamat's like seven, I want to say. Uh, so volume by and large is going to be on the Jacoby side. Taller, much longer, five-inch reach advantage. Way better in the kicking department. Uh, a low calf kick of his has really been coming out well. I know we didn't see it in the old j check fight, but he said he like broke his foot or something right before he was really injured and couldn't throw his kicks. So I expect him to be kicking, staying at range, peppering out that jab that he loves to throw. And then as a Matt's going to have to look for big lunge counters or have to hit that flying knee like he did uh, to win his last fight that he was losing. So I don't know. As long as Jacoby stays sound and alive, I think he's definitely live to win. Uh, but Azamat's going to have that power. Oh, I guess that wasn't his last fight. Devin Clark was his last fight. I'm talking about Fonda Chikwi when he was losing badly for 11 minutes straight and then hit a flying knee from hell. Yeah. So, I don't know. I'm liking Jacoby. Uh, I was a little nervous at the start of this week with this price tag. It's moved down to minus 155 now. Uh, I will probably bet that. I'm going to wait a little bit longer. This keeps getting sweeter and sweeter. Sign me up. But uh, I think Jacoby, with his range and his volume, should be able to find a probably decision victory here. Yeah, so I'm on the similar – pretty much agree with everything you said. To start off, um, going into research, I actually wrote down Azamat's name as who I thought – I would like going in before film. Then after film, I came away loving J Dustin Jacoby. Um, like you, I was also on Dustin Jacoby against Da On Jung, and that was my last sweep. I, I felt like you. I felt like I was on an island, and I didn't know you back then. Yeah. Um, but I swept that card, and that was pinned to my profile until last week when I won eight straight cards. So finally changed it up a bit, but that was a big night for me. So I'm a big Dustin Jacoby fan. I seem to bet him almost every fight. I bet him against Clear Roundtree. I thought he got robbed there and was mad about that as well. I bet him against all of Sajuk and was mad at him for not throwing leg kicks. And I found out after he said he broke his foot, like you mentioned. Um, but he still won that fight. But I thought he could have done even better against all of Sajuk. So here, I, like I said, I opened up like an Azamat. But I came away, I think I'm doing what betters are doing while the line's moving. I saw a 12-0 Russian that I barely, I remember being 3-0 in the UFC. I'm thinking, okay, this guy's ready. And I looked at his film and I'm like, this guy is not ready. Uh, <laughs> that tap on a Chuck we, on Chuck we fight butchering that name I'm sure I do remember that fight live watch it again I did not remember how much success in Chuck was having to that flying knee I thought that fight was a lot closer just off memories that's why you have to go back and watch that watch the fights back like you said um, but he was down for sure before that flying knee um, and I got Devin Clark he, he looked all right but I still think he was gassing at times I don't trust his gas tank I think Jacoby has a great gas tank um, traditionally and i think that this fight lines up well for him like you i'm waiting for the sign to keep dropping right now on my book on DraftKings, he's minus 155 in my head i said it, if he hits 150 i'm betting him for sure um and sam still gonna bet him for sure but i just haven't locked in my bet yet 
Um, I'm on the same side you are. I'm pretty much rather fight exactly the same besides my initial lean. And I'm hoping that wiki cappers keep seeing a 12 and 0 rush and keep giving us a better line. Yeah, I mean, yes, he's undefeated Russian, but he is, he's looking to strike. He doesn't want to wrestle. He's not a big grappler, uh, nor is he – he's on the wrong side of 30 to be like a prospect. Um, yep. Yeah, if you don't dig beneath the surface, I think you can really get sold a false bill of goods on Azmat. And false bill of goods, not saying he's like bad by any stretch of imagination. I actually think he's a pretty – decent fighter with some pretty good striking but uh yeah that chick we fight i had three units on tafan was literally standing like got in line at the casino to go cash it i was like it was on the big screen and we were all watching it, it was just like he is beating that ass walking over i'm just like oh yeah yeah oh, rip <laughs> like, it was just it was so good and then he just dead absolutely dead at the end but why the sport's so beautiful you can hit that 50 point hail mary yeah one other thing i want to add too that i didn't realize too is Azmat's pretty small for the weight class i didn't realize he's 510 like off my memory he's 510 with a 71 inch reach jacoby's gonna tower over him like at weigh-ins that's another thing i'm concerned about if they do face-offs i think the odd might start moving back because jacoby's i think 6'3 with a 78 inch reach like seven inches of reach at 205 the Pretty sizable jump. So I think Jacoby's going to have a lot of success with his jab. And I'm, yeah, and I'm going to be That's one of his favorite strikes. He loves to, and like triple, quadruple, five it up. Like he doesn't just throw one yeah. jab and bring it back. Uh, he's also definitely the better kicker. So that range, I really like it. Azmat's not really going to shoot it to clinch or grapple, I don't think. So I'll, uh, I'll actually probably be on Jacoby for uh, a multi-unit bet. Moving on up the card, we got our co-main event. This is a fight I've gone back and forth on a lot, but I'm sure excited. Billy Quarantillo versus Edson Barboza. If you've been on Twitter, you have to know it's Billy Q fight week. Everyone's talking about it. Um, this is... This is tough because I think Edson is a better technical striker than Billy. And especially here in the first round, he's going to, he's going to put it on him, but Edson's getting a little older. Uh, he really likes having space to find his strikes. He doesn't really look to throw in the phone booth as much as stick and move and find the range. And yeah, he's just slowing down a little bit, getting a little more tired, being a little more, uh damageable and billy q is someone who does not go away he is in your face volume pressure pressure knock me down get right back up right back in your face uh super fun style to watch and i think could be something that really hurt edson the more extended this fight gets uh yeah, I'm not really sure. I think Edson could be a bit of a live dog, especially early. But I think as the longer this fight goes, you really have to love Billy Q here. Um, might maybe take Edson pre-flop and live bet Billy if this hits the second round. But how are you looking at this? Yeah, so I have a very similar read you do. My problem is, like you said, I think Edson by far is a more technical striker, more talented. And I think if this was fight, if you – found like 2018 Edson Barbosa against current day Billy Quarantillo. I think Edson's minus three or 400, but time changes fighters a little bit. And I don't think, I don't think Edson's a shell himself yet, but at the same time, like, I don't know if I can trust him. I could see him easily getting overwhelmed by Quarantillo. If somehow, if Quarantillo wins round one, I expect Barbosa win round one. If Quarantillo wins round one as a favorite, even if he's minus 250, 300 live, I think Quarantillo wins the fight easily, and it's still a safe live bet, even with the juice. So I think Quarantillo's for sure going to win round three. Um, round two is kind of where I see the fight kind of turning. Um, in saying that, Quarantillo's kind of proved me wrong in previous fights. My, one of my biggest bets of last year, or might have been two years ago now, was Shane Burgos to beat Quarantillo. And Quarantillo did lose to Burgos, and I ended up getting the bet right. But that fight was a sweat. Like, Quarantillo will fight for your money. He's never had a boring fight. So it's scary f fading Billy Quarantillo. So I wrote down Edson Barbosa going to research. I still think Barbosa's a side. 
but I'm not excited to bet it by any means. Like it's not one of those fights where I'm going to be thrilled to have a dog ticket. I think it's likely to cash. I could see Quintil just overwhelming them with the fists, keeping the fight close range, putting out three or four times more volume and winning a decision. Or even finishing them late by overwhelming them, kind of like he did to Alexander Hernandez. So I don't know. I'm not too – I'm thrilled to watch this fight and not thrilled to be betting this fight as of now. Yeah. No, I think that Hernandez fight's a good, really good one to look at because, uh, I mean, Billy's not the fastest striker. Hernandez had his timing early. Hernandez just gasses like he always does. So – Will 37-year-old Barboza have better cardio than Hernandez? If yes, I think he's very live to win this as a dog. Yep. He's going to tire out also. Good luck getting tired against Billy Q. <laughs> <laughs> and here we are for our main event. We got Max Holloway versus Arnold Allen. Super stoked for this fight. Very sad that someone has to lose this fight, but we'll be very upset if this is a draw uh max i mean against people not named alexander volkanovsky he's pretty damn good lately um arnold allen's on his own 10 fight win streak looking really good late recently he's looking a lot bigger and stronger uh not sure if we're going to be seeing some arnold grappling but he's definitely added on some muscle mass and it between his last few fights. I don't know. Part of me is a little nervous. Max is starting to accumulate a lot of damage. He's only 31, but he's been fighting the UFC since he was 20. He's been in some serious wars. Uh, I mean, this is like three fights in a row that had like 400 strikes thrown. So ridiculous. I just, I don't know. It's tough to get on the other side of Max because I don't think he's done. Um, like I said, this isn't against Volkanovski. I haven't seen Arnold be a heavy grappler, so I'm not sure he's going to be able to impose his will on Max like that. And I think Max is better cardio. So in a five-round setting, sure, Max might drop the first two, but those last three I think get real interesting with Max's volume. And, uh, yeah, later and later it goes, get a little more nervous for Allen. I think with this fight, uh, especially with some earlier spots on the card, I have enough that I enjoy. I might just watch it, not bet it. Uh, but if I were to lean something, I would say Max pulls away with it late. But uh, I've seen a lot of changing of the guard this year. This could be another one. That's my concern. Like you mentioned, I'm not as worried about Vulcan or Holly's chin because he, I saw some of the shots he was taking from Volkanovski, and I think he Volkanovski is a better striker than Allen. We never know what chin can just go. And like you say, he's 31. But those Hawaiian chins, man, those Hawaiian chins, they last. So I'm going to be on Max pretty big this weekend. I think if Max wasn't – if that Volkanovski fight doesn't happen, let's say Max took a whole year off, I think he's at least minus 300 against Arnold Allen. If it's not coming off a loss. Like that Yair, Yair Rodriguez fight – you just put in, he's minus 700 and dominated that year, who just is now the interim champion. I don't know. I, I think Holloway's the side here. I am a little worried. Arnold Allen, he really did impress me in that Dan Hooker fight, but he was also kind of wild in that finishing exchange. He was throwing shot for shot for shot. Hooker kind of covered up and didn't counter. I don't know. I think I think Holloway gets it done. I don't think he finishes him, but I like Holloway by decision. Um, I'm going to be on Max Holloway this weekend. I know it's not the longest <laughs> analysis ever, but I think that's how the fight's going to play out. No, yeah. I mean, if Max finishes him, it's probably like a, a knockout from attrition. But yeah, from damage. Yeah, I mean, he, best boxer in the UFC versus Calvin Cater. That shit was mythical. That was wild. So I don't know. We'll see. Uh, I agree, though. I, I do think Max is a side. I'm not concerned of his chin yet, but he's taken a lot of damage and it will go one day. He's, Mm -hmm. Saturday the day hopefully not but and like you said Arnold he will throw a little wild uh he was all over hooker don't get me wrong like he had him from the jump and had him hurt bad but in that exchange hooker clipped him on one of those hooks and dropped Arnold to his knee and he popped right back up and knocked him out but like he hit him clean on the chin and rocked him really hard in that first round 
off a off of his back foot while he himself was dazed. So I don't know. Max can probably land some better stuff than that, but we shall see. I know uh seems like Dave, you and I are all gonna be on Jillian Roberts. So it's maybe the proper UFC pick of the week. But yeah, that yeah, that and Jacoby, it sounds like me and you both are pretty big on Dustin Jacoby as well. Yeah, I love Jacoby here. I I hope that line keeps moving down. Any Azimat fans out there watching, please go double your bet. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. He's undefeated Russian, can't lose. Yeah, you got. He's, he's Khabib. He wrestles all the time. Yeah. Well, yeah, man. Thanks for joining us, Joe. Uh, I know you and I are a little newer to each other, but you and Dave go farther back. Uh, really appreciate you hopping on. Think this went well and. Yeah, be happy to probably have you back. Dave and I were thinking maybe having some guests occasionally or when life happens, life happens, you know, so. Yeah, absolutely. It's been a pleasure. Thanks thanks for having me. Uh, feel free to follow me. If you're new or stuck around this long, please, great breakdowns. Uh, fire up MMA Cappers on Twitter. And thanks so much, Mason, for having me. I literally watch you guys every week, make sure I'm not missing anything on the breakdowns that I, I do myself too. So keep up the great work. Yeah, appreciate that a lot, man. Yeah, cheers, y'all. Good luck. And yeah, see you next week.